I don't hear anything coming out of it. <clears throat> Testing one, two, three, four, five, twelve. Yeah, one speaker is working, and one that may or may not be synced up, or otherwise, we can hear you still. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Testing one, one, one. Four, well. We can hear you. We're good. Yeah, on. Just press on. Press on. All right, let's keep going then. All right, so chapter three, Matthew. Oh, I gotta get my notes up. Please stand by. Yes, chapter three. Uh, last time when chapter three, we um, we started looking at John the Baptist, right? And uh, looking at the, particularly the interaction that he had with the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, them coming to him for baptism and, you know, the, the fakeness of, of that. Um, and we, we kind of were in the middle of verse 10 uh, when I stopped. Um, let's look at verse 10 then of chapter 3. It says, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We, we just talked about the, you know, the judgment of, of Christ and the, and the salvation of Christ uh, kind of being hand in hand. And, uh, you know, here we're, we're particularly he's talking about those that are, you know, coming to him uh, with false motives uh, that they're going to be, you know, unless they bear good fruit, unless they have the fruit that is back in verse eight, the fruits of repentance, uh, they're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And I just wanted to spend a minute to talk about the fire, because as I mentioned, fire uh, is the last word in verse 10 and verse 11 and verse 12. So we'll just make sure we understand, uh, you know, God uses fire throughout the Old Testament and he uses it in different ways. Um, but primarily the way that it's used is about judgment. Um, when, he, when he brings up fire, he's talking about judgment. <clears throat> you can go all the way back to, <clears throat> excuse me, all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And the fire and brimstone came down and, and devoured those cities in Genesis 19, 24 in uh, Numbers 1635, uh, there were priests that went in to uh, uh, give offering to God, and they were not supposed to. They went in, uh, at the wrong time, and they were consumed by fire. You have Deuteronomy 424 that says the Lord is a consuming fire, right? So this kind of picture of God uh, and, and fire and, uh, and judgment is kind of all through the Old Testament. We see a similar thing in the New Testament. Let me just uh, have you turn, if you can, to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> in the beginning here of 2 Thessalonians, he's really talking about the uh, God's judgment. And in verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, you know, you see, again, fire and vengeance. And certainly as we studied Revelation, we saw God's fire and ven uh, God's vengeance coming with fire, God's judgment coming with fire over and over again. Um, <clears throat> so here when when uh, he talks about, um, you know, the the. Every every uh, tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He, he's talking about judgment there. If you turn in Matthew to chapter 7, just a quick minute, chapter 7, verse 19, you see here that Jesus essentially says the same thing. And Jesus, in uh, Matthew 7, 19, it says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So again, he's saying that those who do not bear the fruit of righteousness, of, of repentance, uh, they are going to be judged. I want to skip verse 11 for a minute and go to verse 12, and then we'll come back to verse 11. <clears throat> are we okay, Patty? Yeah. Okay. We lost it for a minute. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I want to go down to verse 12 for a minute, uh, and, and we'll come back to verse 11. So verse 12 says, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So here, if you don't, if you're not familiar with the picture here, uh, you know when they would uh, do the harvest, they would uh, essentially clear out a place in the ground and and make it very firm. 
Then they would uh, throw all of the uh, the wheat in that area. Typically, they would get some kind of uh, oxen or something to trample on the wheat to crush it, uh, such that you could break apart the uh, uh, the wheat from the rest of the chaff. Uh, then they would use this thing they call it here a winnowing fan, which was essentially a a big flat shovel to throw the uh, uh, to throw the mixture up in the air, and then the the lightweight chaff, the trash would essentially be blown away by the wind. They would typically set this up in a place where there was a breeze and they would throw it up in the air and that chaff would would uh, uh, would blow away and then they would uh, collect it and burn the chaff away. Um, so so th this is the picture they're trying to say. So again, it's the same thing that, that the wheat is going to be put into the barn. Obviously, those who uh, have the fruits of repentance, uh, those who uh, do know the Lord will be put into the barn Will, will go into heaven, right? Uh, but those who are not, those who are just the chaff, uh, will go into unquenchable fire. And we see, again, we see this picture of chaff uh, many times. We actually saw it back in Daniel. Uh, Daniel uh, 2.35, talk about the chaff being blown away. Uh, in, in Matthew 13.50, it talks about burning the tares, right? Which again, are the, the, the trash that uh, comes along with the, with the wheat. So this idea of judgment and the idea of uh, him burning the, uh, uh, you know, a, a fire being associated with that judgment is just a consistent message. Now, I say all that to kind of get us back to verse 11. Uh, so let's go back there and, and look at verse 11, because it's very, it's a very important uh, um, pieces of information we get in verse 11 that is going to be important as we go into uh, verses 13 to 17, and the interesting event that happens there. So in verse 11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So first of all, we see here, uh, it, it mentions several different baptisms. Um, it, you certainly see the, the baptism that John that John does. Right. And then he says he talks. He says that, you know, the one who comes after him is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we need to understand what that's about. So, first of all, the baptism of John. <clears throat> what was the purpose of the baptism of John? Let me just ask that question of you all. What's the purpose of the baptism of John? Picture. What? I didn't hear anything. Okay, I was going to say, wasn't it for people to repent and to prepare them for the for Jesus's coming? Yep. Was there another thought? I, I was saying just a picture of how we're supposed to, you know, show ourselves being believers. <clears throat> uh, perhaps, CT. I mean, perhaps it's a, a sign, if you will, or, or a um, you know a, a, a picture. Uh, I think it's primarily, as Shannon indicates, it was really around repentance. It was really around, you know, John came to prepare the way uh, for Christ, to get people ready for Christ. So it was to, to show people their sin, right? It was to, for, for people to, to understand that they were sinners, right? Remember, we talked about repentance. It was all about uh, understanding uh, the emotion of it and then the action of it, right? So, so it was all about them understanding their sin and acting on it and, and turning away from it, repenting from it. Um, but it's interesting that John always talked about that, you know, if we, if we look in other places of Scripture, he always talks about that his, his, uh, his baptism was much different from the baptism that would come after him. And so we see it here, right? You know, it says, He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, so you know the picture. We, you know, we've uh, certainly heard the stories about uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and how that was a, a very lowly task, right? That Jesus would do that. Uh, and so here we, he talks about carrying the sandals. This is a very similar task. Would, this would be a the lowly servant would actually carry the sandals, um, and you know would wash the feet. Anything having to do with the feet, that was uh, that was a pretty lowly uh, servant. And, and Jesus and, and John here is saying, I'm not even worthy to do that. I'm not even, I'm the lower than the lowest servant. I can't even carry the sandals or wash the feet. I'm not worthy to do that compared to uh, this Jesus who's going to be coming after him, this, this one who is mightier than I. 
it's it's uh, <clears throat> as well. We'll look into uh, John a little bit later, um, <clears throat> but in that place, uh, John the Baptist says, you know, uh, he must increase, I must decrease. Right? You remember those those sayings. So John consistently had this picture of uh, of Jesus and his baptism being different from the one that that he was going to bring. <clears throat> Now, the first thing he says, um, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we need to talk about that. What does he mean that he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit? So I want you to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> verse 15. Here we have Jesus actually promising the Holy Spirit was to come in John 14, 15. Mine says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you, right? So Jesus here promises that the Holy Spirit will come. Uh, and then if you go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> something in my throat that just will not disappear. <clears> 1 <throat> Corinthians 12, 12. Here Paul talks about baptism first corinthians 12 12 says for as many for for as the body is one and has many members but all the members of that one body being many are one body also in christ for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether jews or greeks whether slaves or free and have all been made to drink in one spirit for in fact the body is not one member but many so here he talks to, you know, as we are baptized into the spirit, we are baptized into the body of Christ. We become one with Christ. We become one with the spirit. We become one with other members of the body, right? Now, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> In Acts 19, um, again, we have the disciples now out doing things, right? Uh, interacting with uh, with people the people across uh, uh, Judea now across other countries in Acts chapter 19 um, we have an interesting event that happens we'll start at verse one it says it happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus and finding some disciples he said to them did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed and they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here you see uh, Paul interacting with these folks at Ephesus, and, and very clearly delineating between these two baptisms, right? He says, yes, there was the baptism of John. It was about repentance, uh, but there's a separate baptism that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, he then uh, goes about baptizing them uh, in verse three. Uh, and yes, yes, right? So in verse five, he baptizes them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now. So you see here, so I just want to make clear this is a distinction between John's baptism, the baptism that John did, which was about repentance, which was about sin, and the baptism that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which again is about becoming one with the Holy Spirit, becoming one with Christ, becoming one with the body of Christ. And just hold that in your heads for a little bit. I'm going to come back to that in thought. But first, I want to finish up what we have here in verse 12. No, I'm sorry, verse 11, right? Go back to, to Matthew 3.11. <clears throat> he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, the question is, what is this baptism of fire that we have here in verse 11? 
He has a baptism of John, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of fire. What is the baptism of fire? Any thoughts on that? Pentecost. Somebody said Pentecost? Yeah. Yeah. So that is often how this is thought, that the Holy Spirit and fire, right? We know that the uh, that that uh, you know there were tongues like fire on the heads of the disciples when the Holy Spirit came, and so often that uh, those two things are connected here. I think that's not right. Um, I think that there's a theme here from verse 10, 11, and 12 about fire, uh, about being thrown into the lake of fire, about being burned up by the unquenchable fire. I think this fire is the same fire. I think he's talking about the fire of judgment. <clears throat> Um, when Jesus talks about uh, being baptized, uh, he says he's going to have to go through a baptism. Uh, he's talking about him dying, right? Uh, uh, later on, we'll get to that in a little bit. But but this this fire, I believe, here is the fire of judgment. He's saying that uh, that, um, that there's a baptism of John, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's also a baptism of, of fire. There's a baptism of judgment that will come. He's, again, just getting them ready for the judgment that will come in the future, right? And then in that, in that judgment, in that baptism, uh, some will, uh, you know, uh, obviously the Christians will be pulled out of that, uh, but, the, uh, but most of the, the non-believers, uh, again, will be burned up in that fire, will be thrown into that fire. Uh, they will be burned up as chaff, as it's, as it's talked about in 10 and 12. I don't think he just... Uh, changes his thought process in verse 11 uh, from what he's been talking about in verses 10 and 12. And so that's why I think he's really talking here about the fire of judgment. Anybody want to push back on that or other thoughts on it? The, the thought that I have on it is, is, is this like the fire that is, I'm not sure where the reference is. I think it's in, I think Peter writes about it, um, building your, your, your works on a, on a foundation and then your works will be tested by fire, and those that are are not for Christ will be burned up, and um, those that are that are for Christ will will stand. Yeah, I think it could be Rick. I think even more so though, he's talking about the fire of hell uh, that the non-believers that these these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees are going to go through. <laughs> Are going to go into and in the final judgment. I think he's really talking about that at this point in time. <clears throat> but it could encompass what you said also. It's that it's that final judgment fire, if you will. Yeah. Well, it, one way or the other, they're, they're both purifying fires. They both yeah. Uh, right. Destroy sin. Right. Okay, now, having said all that, we said we've got John's baptism, we got the Holy Spirit baptism, we got the judgment baptism. Let me ask this question to the group. What is Christian baptism? What's the baptism that we all went through? Do, 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 do. Anybody want to uh, try? Well, I'm not sure what you're asking, but I'll be brave and step out there on a limb. <laughs> uh, for me, as a Christian, I think I was baptized first with the Holy Spirit. And then once my heart was convicted to follow Jesus and to accept him as my Lord and Savior, then I was baptized by the water. And hopefully someday when I'm in heaven, I'll be baptized well, I won't be baptized by fire, but I'll go through that judgment. Are you asking about the order or is there a different baptism that I don't know about? <laughs> You're answering the question as, as I was trying to get to. So, so let me let me see if I got can get anybody else to be as brave as you are. What is Christian baptism compared to these three things that we've just mentioned? How's it fit? First, it's an act of obedience. Okay. It's it's also publicly <laughs> identifying with Christ. Okay. 
So what does that have to do with these three baptisms? Is it John's baptism? Is it the Holy Spirit baptism? Is it the baptism of judgment? What What is Christian baptism? What happens at Christian baptism? Your <laughs> 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 like, responses are just great, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I, well, wouldn't, I hope no one who's a non-Christian ever asked you this question. Well, wouldn't it be just what I I mean, like I said originally, that the first thing that I felt as my baptism was to accept Jesus as my Savior. was, And then I felt the Holy Spirit within me. So, I don't know. I'm not sure if I know what you're asking. <laughs> well, there's a repentance of the John baptism because you have to repent of your sins. Right. Uh, in order to be sanctified and, you know, to be saved. And then there is the, you know, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, of course. You know, if you're looking, talking about order, Holy Spirit was convicting you and, you know, working on your heart um, before you actually repented of your sins, maybe, and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, so then the Holy Spirit is, is in you, with you. Uh, is the presence of God with you. So I guess my feeling is, is our Christian baptism is John and the Holy Spirit's baptism. Does that make sense? And I then the, the physical water baptism that you choose in obedience after that to show that you have made this commitment. So is that what you're calling the Christian baptism, Rich, the, our water baptism, or what do you... We get dipped. You know, we go up front, we get dipped, right? What is what is that about? <laughs> That's, I think it may be part of it. When you say Christian baptism, yeah, yeah. I think we were trying to understand what you meant. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I think I understand better now. So I, I still think that's just a, just a picture for other people to see, like everybody was saying here, that it's, we're fought, we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Well, you're showing that you're... You're dead to your old self, and it's the physical immersion. Then you come back up alive in Christ. Is what that's what they say when they're baptizing us here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you've made a decision to turn, um, you know, to repent of your sins and turn and be saved. It's and believers' baptism. It's a believers' baptism. Yeah. So. so I don't think it does anything besides put a picture out there for you. Symbolic. So, well, yeah. if that's what you're asking. Yeah, that is what I'm asking. Uh, you know, there are those who believe that, um, you know, when you get baptized, that's when you get the Holy Spirit, right? Um, that, that is not what we believe. I, I, so I'm agreeing with everything that you said. I, and maybe I, I confused you with the words I used. I apologize. I wasn't trying to confuse you. But I was trying to uh, make sure that we're clear on these baptisms, right? So sometimes I try to confuse you, but I wasn't this time. Um, so yeah, so the, the the what I was saying, the Christian baptism, the baptism that we all went through, right, is really about uh, you know showing the world that we have made this decision, right? Showing the world that Christ has come into our lives, the Holy Spirit has come into us. You know, at the you know the Southern, as Southern Baptists, we believe that the Holy Spirit comes into you when you are saved, when you accept Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you at that point in time. It's not a separate baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit occurs at salvation. Um, so, so, so I just wanted to make sure we had that clarity before we get into uh, the next section, which is going to raise another set of questions. All right. Any? Hey, Rich. I, yeah. I had kind of a thought. Um, on that Acts verse, you know, when they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh, they they have these outward things where they're speaking in tongues and prophesying. And I think verses like that have, have always confused me on the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I don't know if anybody else felt that way, but when I was, you know, first baptized, you know, I was really confused about the Holy Spirit because it's like, am I, if I'm, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? If I'm not speaking with tongues and prophesying and have this huge outward emotional display, or is it just, you know, and and I, I learned over time, I think, that, that the Holy Spirit doesn't, you know, always manifest itself in that way. You know, it can speak to your mind, your soul and do other things. And so, you know, it took me a while as a new believer to understand that I, I thought maybe 
that I was not filled with the Holy Spirit just because I didn't have these outward displays. So. And then there's the confusion of, like I was brought up Methodist, so I was baptized as an infant, and then I had confirmation, which is supposedly maybe when the Holy Spirit came, because you had already been baptized. It is very, you know, it is very confusing um, coming from something different, you know, how you were brought up. Um, I mean, I under totally understand now what the believer's baptism is, and I was baptized as an adult. Um, because I realized my parents had decided that and I hadn't made the decision myself. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it gets really convoluted with um, different, um, you know, other denominations, you know? Yep, absolutely. I was brought up Methodist also. I know what you're talking about. Went through the same study of the process. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, go down that train. You know, I know that that's not where we're at right now, but, you know, but anyways, I just, it took me a while to to understand, I think, more on the Holy Spirit for God to reveal. Yeah, Hugh, you know, let me say this. Uh, we're going to deal with that issue uh, in, in more depth later on in Matthew. And so rather than sidetrack the discussion here to do that, uh, let me hold it, okay? Because uh, we were definitely going to have that as we get into some later uh, sections in Matthew. We're going to have to deal with the, the Holy Spirit and what that uh, and what that means. So we'll come back to that. <clears throat> All right. Um, I do want to show you one other thing. If you're confused, if you're not confused yet, turn to uh, John. You need to see this one. Turn to John chapter three, Gospel of John, chapter three, verse twenty-two. This is what I referred to earlier, this section, and if you look down at verse 30, this is where he says, he must increase, I must decrease. But I want to back up to verse 22, John chapter 3, and just read what it says here. It says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there. That makes sense. And they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. There arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness and said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride... Is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears, rejoices, et cetera, et cetera. He must increase, I must decrease, right? So we have this interesting interaction uh, when the Jews come to John and ask about Jesus. What's interesting here is that Jesus, in verse 22, Jesus and his disciples are baptizing. <clears throat> now, my question to you is, what baptism are Jesus and his disciples baptizing with in What 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 is this baptism that Jesus is baptizing? Well, since they're using water, would it just be the the repent and preparing the way for the Messiah? Or if Jesus lays hands on them, does that mean they automatically have the Holy Spirit? That's the question I'm asking, Shannon. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I think that if Jesus laid hands on me during a baptism, I would be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know there's some part in this Bible I've read that when he laid hands on the disciples, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So I would think that he was he was filling them with the Holy Spirit. So I think it's the same thing. I think it's still just a picture. I mean, because John's doing it. I mean, they're all doing it. And so, Jesus, and this one, Jesus is not the one doing the baptizing. The uh, disciples. The disciples are. Yeah. The reference is verse four two. Yeah, there there's some question as to whether this is uh, saying the disciples are doing the baptism or Jesus is doing the baptism, right? <clears throat> this one seems to infer that both Jesus and the disciples. The other one seems to infer that it's just the disciples that are doing it. That's a question. 
So the whole. But either way, if if his disciples are doing it, what baptism are the disciples baptizing? Well, Pentecost has not yet occurred. Neither right. Is Neither is the death nor resurrection. Right. So. I think he baptized into his death before he died. Correct. So it's a just a repentance baptism, then, right? Yeah, I think the right answer yeah. here is that it is the repentance baptism, right? Essentially, you know, we've seen that that uh, the first message that Jesus gives is repent, right? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the same message that John gives. And so he is baptizing them for repentance in the same way that John was. It seems awkward, right, for us to think about that. Uh, you know, as Shannon says, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> it's a little awkward to think about Jesus baptizing for repentance and not going the full uh, you know, the full job here. But as uh, as you guys have said, you know, the death has not occurred. The resurrection has not occurred. Pentecost has not said, you know, when he says that the 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 helper will come, well, that comes later. Right. So he's not he's not baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. He's baptizing them for repentance at this point in time. So well, so I think, uh, you know, it's it's the transition from John the Baptist doing this to Jesus and the disciples doing this. As he said, he's going to decrease so Christ can increase. Right, right. And okay. From, from, an, from another standpoint, again, it's to me, it's and it, and it just a, it's a picture again. I mean, these people aren't being, the water's not cleansing them and making them whole. I mean, they've made a decision, so they're now saying, hey, I'm re I've repented. And this is my baptism to show that I've repented. Right. And, and certainly we saw when the, you know, the scribes and Pharisees came, they were not, uh, you know, they were going through the motion. Right. But because they were not showing the fruits of repentance, uh, you know, that's what John was yelling at them about. So <laughs> certainly you're correct in that, uh, CT. Acknowledging that uh, necessarily the Christ is the Son of God. Yeah, I don't think they are doing that at this point in time. No, they're, they're simply repenting of their sins, uh, getting ready to hear and understand, uh, you know, who Christ is, but not there yet. OK, we all right now. All right. So let's let's then continue on to verse 13, because now we get a real uh, change in the action <laughs> from what we have uh, been a part of. Uh, and let me just let me just remind you kind of where we are, where we we have, where we have been. Uh, again, uh, Matthew's main job uh, in his mind is to convince you that Jesus is the King, right? He begins, and I got a little summary here if you want it. In in, in chapter one, verse one through seventeen, he is giving us the ancestry, the genealogy of the King, right? In chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, it's the birth of the king and what happens around that birth. In chapter 2, 1 through 12, it's the worship of the king by the wise men. In chapter 2, verse 13 to 23, it's the prophecy of the king, right? We went back and looked at the Old Testament prophecies. And then chapter 3, 1 through 12, which we've just been through, we talked about the herald of the king, right? Uh, John the Baptist being the herald of the king. Now in verses 13 through 17, we get to a section that could be called the commissioning of the king. The king is being set forth and commissioned uh, to do the task that's set before him. What's really cool in this section is that we see the son, the spirit, and the father all together as a part of this commissioning service, if you will, uh, for Jesus as, uh, as he sets about on, on his ministry. All right, so let's read verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. So, so when does this occur? Uh, it just says then. It's sometime during John's ministry in the wilderness, right? There are many people who think that, if you remember, John and Jesus are cousins. They are born six months apart. So many people. Folks think that John began his ministry, and then six months later, Jesus began his ministry. Remember, we talked about uh, people often started their ministries at age 30, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's not unlikely to think about John was uh, uh, out there preaching his message of repentance, kingdom of heaven as a hand, for six months before Jesus shows up here. 
So Jesus here then comes, it says, from Galilee. Um, um, so, uh, and, and if you look over in, uh, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, it talks about uh, he actually comes from Nazareth, right? So this is, a, uh, this is probably a 60-mile walk uh, that he has to take to get from Nazareth down to the Jordan, uh, where this baptism is, is taking place, which is probably a two- to three-day journey. Uh, you know, if you're walking through that that area, so uh, he, he he brings it down. Uh, he he comes down for this baptism. Um, I mentioned when we looked at John uh, in in chapter three, verse one. Uh, you know, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching. Here we have the same word. Jesus came from Galilee. Uh, that word is um, is stronger in the Greek than it comes across in the English. It really is that. Uh, he, he's, he's being made public. Uh, it's the initiation of his ministry. He's coming forth, if you will, uh, which doesn't quite come uh, come out in, uh, in the, this little word, word came. He, he's really he's coming forth from Galilee, maybe a better way to say it. Um, I, I just want to pause and say it's, it's kind of uh, kind of amazing to think about that. You know, Jesus spent 30 years in in Nazareth kind of in obscurity, right? Uh, with nobody knowing who he was or what he was doing. Um, and then all of a sudden he breaks forth on the scene here. Uh, you you got to also, I, I, I just in my mind, at least picture heaven, you know, kind of just waiting uh, for, for the angels, just waiting with bated breath <clears throat> for Jesus to kind of come forth uh, after the, you know, he gets sent down to, uh, he, he's living on, in, uh, you know, on, on the earth for 30 years. <clears throat> without anything happening until until this moment uh, when he comes forth. Anyway, um, he, he comes forth here uh, from the Galilee to John at the Jordan uh, to be baptized by him. Now, he comes to John. Um, does he know John? I would imagine so. Because. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of debate about this in the commentaries. But I mean, they're cousins. They probably played together. They probably grew up somewhat together. At some point in time, John goes off to the wilderness for his Nazarite vow, but that's probably not until later on uh, in his life. He doesn't do that as a child. Um, but but at some point, he does that. But this is certainly true that uh, they you know they probably grew up together. The other thing I want to remind you, um, let me just read it for you. In Luke chapter one, you remember when uh, Mary went to visit Elizabeth. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, uh, no, verse 41, let me just read that to you. It says, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. That would be John, that would be John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out of a loud voice saying, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come from me? Right. That should come to me. So here Elizabeth is recognizing that the baby in Mary's womb is her Lord. I mean, it's an amazing statement. Right. She's filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, uh, when this occurs. And obviously uh, the Holy Spirit has told her this is your Lord. This is, you know, this is the, the Christ. So Elizabeth knew what was going on. Right. She knew who this was. And certainly she would have shared that with her child, John the Baptist, right? As to who this was, uh, that this was a special child, maybe obviously didn't understand all of it, but uh, knew enough to call him Lord. So, so when, when, uh, when Jesus, uh, you know, goes to, to John the Baptist, they know each other and they know that there's something special about, about each of them, right? John certainly knows who, who, uh, who Jesus is when he shows up on the scene. Um, now, the question, however, that is really important that we've got to deal with, and we'll start dealing with it today and maybe not finish until next time, but, um, and that question is, why is Jesus baptized, right? Jesus came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and the question has got to be why. And so let me just talk a minute, and then I will open it up for your thoughts on this in a minute, but um, obviously... John's baptism was about repentance, was about confession of sin. Uh, 
we believe that Jesus was without sin, but for some reason he comes to be baptized by John. And by, by, by the way, a sinner named John, right? I mean, John is a sinner and he comes to, he comes to John to be baptized. Now, let me just throw out a couple of, uh, by throw out, I mean throw away, uh, a couple of, uh, of ideas as to why this occurred that, that, are, that are around. One is that uh, there are some apocryphal books. Uh, you know, these are books that not, did not get into the canon of Scripture uh, that said that, uh, that John's mother convinced him that he needed to go get uh, uh, in, in John's baptism, that there was some kind of discussion at the, at the family, and his mother said, no, you, I really want you to go, and I really want you to get baptized by John, and that's why Jesus did it, is because he was just being obedient to his mother. Okay, uh, that's not supported in Scripture anywhere. That doesn't make any sense uh, from Scripture, but I just want you to know that was out there. <coughs> the Gnostics, you remember the Gnostics, uh, were a group of people that were around during this time. They believed that uh, uh, during Christ's baptism, this is when he got the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is when uh, the Holy Spirit actually came to him. Before this, he was just a regular man. He was a normal, sinful human being. Uh, and then uh, at baptism, this is when the Holy Spirit came, uh, made him sinless, uh, such that he could fulfill his, uh, uh, his job, if you will. Uh, you know, again, this, this is not connected to anything that we have in Scripture. You know, we, we again, taking us right back to the virgin birth, uh, you know, that he was uh, sinless from birth uh, because he was born of the Holy Spirit. So that, that one doesn't make any sense. The third one <clears throat> that I just want to throw away is that there are those that believe that <clears throat> in his baptism, he purchased righteousness for sinners. In other words, it says he did all this for righteousness, right? When we get down to why Jesus says he does this, he does this. And, and some people believe that, well, he purchased righteousness via the baptism. The baptism was where he purchased righteousness. Now, what we believe is he purchased righteousness at the cross, right? Not at baptism. And so just adding that on doesn't make any sense at all. All right. So, so you know, again, people have had trouble with, uh, with this uh, Jesus getting baptized, so look at verse 14, and we'll see that John himself had trouble with this baptism, right? Uh, verse 14, it says, And John tried to prevent him, <coughs> saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? Now, it, sh it should be noted that when it says John tried to prevent him, that's a, uh, a better way might be to say John continued to try to prevent him. He over and over you know, tried to say, don't, 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 I can't, I can't. I can't baptize you, don't come, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, so, so John is continually trying to, to tell him not to, uh, uh, that he can't baptize him. Now, I do want you to turn for a minute to, to John, the Gospel of John again. Gospel of John, verse uh, chapter one, verse 29, when we see here the... Um, a, di a different picture of, of this baptism. In John one twenty nine, it just gives us some other insights. John one twenty nine says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So first of all, John sees Jesus, <coughs> not only recognizes him as his cousin, but calls him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world which is kind of an amazing statement for John to make. Remember also that John, <clears throat> excuse me, John comes from a family of priests, right? So John is essentially a priest. And when he calls him the Lamb of God, I mean, he, he, is, he is pointing him out as the sacrifice. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel before I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. 
So it's interesting in here at one point, you know, it indicates that he knows who Jesus is. Then he says, I don't know him. Uh, it, it really is a matter of him knowing him in, uh, you know, knowing him as his cousin, knowing something special about him, you know, that he's somehow the Lamb of God. But then once he sees the Spirit descending upon him, then he knows for sure. Uh, then he knows that this is the Son of God. So it, it's just an interesting uh, uh, um, clarification about what John knew and what John did not know uh, when when Jesus comes to him. So so again, let me let me just go back to Matthew. He says, um, <clears throat> "I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me." So G John is essentially recognizing that this. Jesus, who's coming to him, does not need his baptism, does not need to repent of sins. It's, it's a pretty actually powerful statement about Jesus as a sinless human being, right? That John says, you do not need to be baptized by me. Uh, I need to be baptized by you. I'm a sinner. I need to be baptized for, for my sin, but you do not. Why are you coming to me? So I, I don't want you to miss the point that this is a it's the first thing that anyone else says about Jesus, and that thing is that he is sinless and does not require um, does not require this baptism. All right, so let's just take a couple of minutes here uh, and, and ask you this question: Why did Jesus get baptized? Could one of the reasons be for um, for that confirmation from God that He is God's Son? I mean, Jesus wanted wanted everybody to know and to ha that He He was. I mean, it was kind of like a that wow moment that it's a confirmation that He is Jesus and He is God's Son. Right. So certainly, is a part of this whole uh, you know anointing the, the, this whole setting Him apart. Uh, it could be that that is part of it. I guess the question I would ask is. Gee, did God need to do that, or could he have just uh, sent down the dove and said, this is my beloved son? Right? Did he need to have the baptism also? What's the point of the baptism as a part of that big celebration, if you will, that God wants to do? Because he, go ahead. It's foreshadowing of his death and resurrection. Foreshadowing, perhaps? Yeah. Well, he's fully man and he's fully God. So the fully man part needs to do what and show what man needs to do so that we understand. You know what I'm saying? Say it again. But, but because Jesus is fully man and fully God, the baptism is the fully man part, like what he's showing us. Okay. Yes, no? Other <laughs> thoughts? No, no, I'm going to come back to that. The reason I'm not commenting on it, I want to come back to that thought a little bit later. So. Other, okay. other comments? <clears throat> to expand on that, that thought, Jesus came to live a human life to identify with us as humans. Right. And he had this, one of the most important things we do as humans is to, to be baptized. So he was yeah, living the, the man part of his life. He was, he was doing it as a man. I, I think also he was he was endorsing John's ministry, wasn't he? Saying that what John is doing is is um, of God, and that's why I'm doing it as well. It's it, he, he's giving credibility to John's baptism. Okay. What else? These are all good. These are all good thoughts. Other things. <laughs> Tracy has something to say. <laughs> Baptism is an outward expression of your faith, showing that a change has taken place. And his was not a change of like needing to repent, but it was a change in that his life was getting ready to take on a new direction because he's getting ready to start his ministry. Okay. And, and I think somebody used the word important a little while ago. I think this was Christ showing this is important to do. This is this is a this is an action that you need to be. If I, I'm being, I'm doing it. Everybody should follow this this action to the to their capable as much as they're capable. 
Okay. Any other thoughts? These are all good. I'm going to wrap all these together. I think I'm just, are there any other thoughts on this? These are good. These are good elements. Yeah, it's, it's time. Um, so let me, let me uh, just <clears throat> say Jesus actually answers this question, of course, in verse 15, right? Uh, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed it. So we need to understand what in the world Jesus is saying when he says uh, it's fitting to fulfill all righteousness. So, so I'm going to just leave that for your homework assignment. And, and, and just I want you to ponder this, this baptism of Jesus. Why did Jesus allow it? Why did Jesus, in fact, uh, more than allow it, want to make sure it happened? Um, and, 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 and what was the point of it? What, what's, the, what's the impact of it? Uh, what was he trying to say by it? I think some of the things that you have said are a part of it. And I, I just I want to uh, talk about it some more because I think there's there's more to it than even what you've said so far. So that's good. All right. Uh, any any closing thoughts on that before I transition to Hugh? All right. So let's uh, let's have prayer requests. Let me uh, let me help you by getting the folks that are online and then I'll let him. Uh, uh, talk to the folks there in the room. So, Shannon, uh, prayer request. Okay. Yep. Nope. Everything's going really well. No prayer request. Uh, my other than safe travels for my son Chris and his family. They're on spring break in Colorado skiing. So, no broken bones, hopefully, and everything goes well. But other than that, everything's going really great. Good. Rick and Debbie. Well, we're in the same. Um, we're home because Deb is uh, feeling the cumulative effects of her treatment, and it's um, she's got three more days next week of radiation, and that will be over. But she's she's really exhausted, and um, it's it's um, yeah, it's getting to be a toll. Yeah, go take a nap, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Had another nap. <laughs> Yeah. Other than that, we're, yeah, that's like getting beaten the head over and over and over again. So uh, we, we continue to pray for you in this. It's uh, it's tough. <clears throat> Joe? Nothing. Nothing. All right. Joe's birthday is this week. It's going to be 14. All right. Uh, Hugh, you want to do the folks in the room there? All right. Let's just uh, start. Yeah, you want to start from that side? Um, Phil P. sent me a message this morning. He said he had a bad night. Um, he had an extreme blood sugar drop, and he could hardly see. But he is okay now, and he wants us to pray for, I guess, his spiritual um, leader, uh, that gentleman, Layton. His thought pass surgery is this Wednesday. And just to praise, my sister-in-law did make it home on Friday, and so now just continue prayer for her as she is rehabilitating at home. Great. Okay. Uh, we're doing good. Uh, Travel mercies for Terry. She and two other ladies are driving back to Pennsylvania. Uh, they were up there this weekend, and so they can be back this afternoon. So other than that, we're doing good. Must go. Sure. <laughs> um, I actually don't have an update on Terry Price, but we do have a praise. If I can share, we're going to be grandparents in August. Yeah. So they did a uh, surprise. That was really old. I know. <laughs> surprise birthday gift for Brian, and then they did a reveal. We were FaceTiming with them, um, and so it's a little girl. So. Congratulations. So just prayer. She's a high risk pregnancy. Just prayers for a healthy um, pregnancy, and um, she'll have to have a C-section delivery and everything. So I'll keep you posted. But we're excited. We don't have many girls in the family. <laughs> hey, Rich. I don't know if you noticed or not, but you didn't stop the recording. Did you want to do that? I do. Thank you. Yep. I'll keep going. <laughs>